So <coughs> if, if people want to take their seats, um, we'll reconvene for the afternoon session. Okay, thanks very much. So I'd like to welcome you all back to the afternoon session of this Interprofessional Learning Conference. Um, I hope you all enjoyed lunch. Uh, you were all a little bit quiet just before lunch uh, and you had the excuse that you wanted to have your lunch. So now that you've had it, we're expecting lots of uh, interaction and lots of questions and discussions this afternoon. Um, so my name is Paul Cavan. I work with the Medical Council of Ireland. And this conference is brought to you by uh, a grouping of uh, regulators of the health and social care professionals here in Ireland. And as regulators, I suppose we're, we're very well known for working downstream in terms of responding to concerns that might arise with uh, health and social care professionals practice. But I suppose we feel, and part of the reason in terms of hosting this conference today is that we feel as health and social care professional regulators, we really can't fulfil our potential unless we're working upstream as well. And that relates to our work in uh, accrediting education and training for professionals, but also uh, influencing and informing broader policy, policy discussion about matters that shape professional practice. Um, Mary Robinson, our former president, famously said that health systems are the heart of society and that health and social care professionals are the blood. And I think one of these big issues that uh, Ireland faces and that most other developed health system faces as well in terms of health system is planning a fit for purpose workforce. And I'm delighted to introduce uh, Prof uh, James Buchan, uh, who's come to us uh, today to talk about that very matter, uh, planning uh, the health workforce for uh, changing health health systems. Uh, Prof Buchan um, currently is associated with the WHO Collaborating Centre at the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. Um, so I don't know where you are in terms of body clock at the moment. I hope you're managing to adjust local time. Uh, and as you can see in terms of his bio, um, he has very impressive credentials and is associated with a number of other organisations uh, in Scotland, in uh, Portugal, and um, has uh, done work with a range of different international organisations, the EU, the OECD, the WHO, uh, the International Labour Organisation and the World Bank as well. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Prof James Buchan and... Um, I hope you enjoyed the session this afternoon. Thank you, Paul. Um, um, when I agreed to speak here and, and received the, the programme, I realised that yet again I've got the graveyard slot, the one just after lunch. Uh, you've all had a nice lunch. Um, it's nice and warm in here, the lights are going to go down. And I was reflecting, why is it I get the graveyard slot so often? And it's one of two reasons. I'm flattering myself, I think it's because I can wake up an audience, or it might be that just it's the best, best place to bury me because um, I've got nothing new to say. I usually, um, in international conferences when this happens, I, I resort to turning on a bit of the, the Celtic charm and the Scottish accent, and that usually... Uh, woos the audience, but I realised, of course, that I'm in Ireland and I'm in the country that outcharms the Scots when it comes to the, the Celtic Blarney, so that's not going to work. Um, so, last resort of the charlatan, how do I keep the audience awake? Uh, there's um, halfway through my presentation, I'm going to give you a small quiz and there may be a prize. <laughs> so, pay attention. Uh, and when we get to it, we'll see if anyone can get the answer. Okay, um, why am I here? Um, I'm, I suppose, a, a confession. I work in workforce planning, workforce policy. Although I have a university email, I'm hardly ever there. I don't engage much now directly in what you might regard as uh, classic forms of education while undergraduates. So, uh, given the, the presentations we've already had and acknowledging that we all want to integrate, I tend to be at the moment, um, I come from the other side, so to speak. I'm, I'm from policy and planning and connecting back into education, recognising, as John said this morning, it's critical in terms of uh, not only delivering the new workers for the workforce, but sustaining them, uh, keeping them fit for purpose as they go through their careers. So uh, when I was asked to speak, and I, I, I was kind of 
I've had to put my hand up. I had to go online and find out what definition of interprofessional learning was. I thought I knew. Um, I was pretty certain that I had an idea what it was, but I'd never actually seen it clearly defined. So I went online and I saw several definitions, which, you know, it's the, the wonders of the internet. You can um, end up two hours later with a, a headache and still not be quite clear what you were looking for. But my conclusion, and this becomes, I suppose, my takeaway message, is that um, it's been reinforced in me how critically important IPL is if Ireland and other countries is to improve the outcomes of its population in terms of health and well-being um, and effectively uses and continues to effectively use its health workforce. Um, IPL, I think, is, is the glue that, that holds the workforce together, keeps them motivated, uh, keeps them there as well in terms of retention. And distilling that down into an even simpler take-home message, I've come to the conclusion that IPL is so important that we can't just leave it to the educators. Um, they're important in, in working with others to deliver it, but unless we get policymakers, politicians at the most senior level to fully appreciate how important it is, we will continue to have the same challenge we have about trying to advocate for it. So, um, in terms of uh, structure for my presentation for the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to go through a, a few issues which loosely connect together um, in terms of how education and IPL connects into the broader context of health workforce policy and planning. Look briefly at the global context, talk a little about the evidence base, risk of over-specialization, pick up on the issue of politics, uh, conclude a little on enablers and constraints, what can we use to in ensure that IPL is there and is there in the right way, uh, what's stopping that happening, and then just finish with my own sort of thoughts on, on where next. Uh, I'm not going to dwell a long time on global issues. We're all very well aware, I think, of, of some of the, the big challenges that are impacting on health workforces in, in most countries. Um, and Ireland is, is there front and centre in having a, an ageing population, an ageing workforce, and that, cr that brings with it a range of challenges around uh, IPL. Um, you're looking at a mature workforce, many of whom have been in the system quite a long time. Their needs, their priorities, their preferences are very different from those who've just entered. Uh, the, the care provided to the population is having to change uh, with the shift that everyone talks about but not many countries have achieved very effectively, which is towards primary care. But it's going to have to happen because we're seeing more and more elderly with comorbidities, multiple morbidities chronic disease who will be cared at home. We've had the impact of the global financial crisis, which I don't need to tell you about. You've seen its impact on the health workforce, staffing reductions, pay reductions, uh, pension constraints, uh, posts being left vacant. Coming through the worst of that now, but it's still leaving a legacy uh, in terms of pent up mobility, which you'll begin to see as the economy improves. Some people who've stayed in the workforce will move out or move on. We've got the huge challenge of universal health coverage and in most countries, including Ireland, the need to look at how we can improve access to underserved communities. And much of that is about having the workforce with the right skills in the right place to improve access. And if you bundle that all together, uh, a real key message is around sustainable health workforce um, investment in the long term in keeping and motivating your workforce and using IPL as one of the tools to re-energize them, update them, keep them oriented. And a few other issues I think to consider when we're, we're looking at IPL and context. Uh, this morning we heard that um, everyone is a service user. I'd actually turn that around and also say that virtually everyone is in the health workforce, if you use a very broad definition of what that is. There's an artificial distinction between people who are paid to provide care, 
and those who are providing care because their relative or their neighbor or their volunteers. And I think we need to be looking at um, moving forward with a very broad-based holistic definition of workforce when we're talking about IPL. Some of IPL will be to uh, those who are paid to deliver care in order to ensure they are effective at working alongside and with volunteers and relatives. Um, if we're talking about a patient-centered approach to care, we've got to recognize that the patient at the center of that approach is also going to be providing some of the care themselves. So it's about communicating with them, working with them. So a very broad, holistic definition. We could spend all afternoon talking about what is workforce planning. It varies significantly in different countries, different contexts. I'll come back to that with a couple more slides, but the real challenge is ensuring that your planning approach, your planning process is, is fit for purpose and meets country priorities. And we've had, as John mentioned this morning, um, a lot of emphasis recently on tr transformative education for health professionals and the impact that can have. And just looking at that bullet point along with bullet point one, uh, a risk if we only talk about health professionals that we're only looking at even part of the paid workforce. A lot of the frontline hands-on care in any health system is being provided by various types of care assistant and we need to be very certain that they are part of the process when we're talking about IPL. And we've got to be looking at um, workforce planning being effectively integrated with education, with funding, with regulation, with service delivery and employment. And if any one of those building blocks is not there, uh, there are going to be uh, real problems in sustaining and maintaining an effective health workforce. And this in part, in any country that's um, predicated on a public service ethos, this is about joined up government. Uh, it's about different government departments aligning well. And we need to be clear where we want to be on the debate on do we need lots of specialists or do we need lots of generalists? Or is there a somewhere along that continuum that meets uh, the country's population health needs most effectively. Uh, the risk always here is that professions want to professionalize and often push down the specialist continuum. And uh, there has to be a good reason for that that is going to be demonstrably there in terms of improvements to care of the population. And again, I'll come back to that one later. So I'm just going to pick up on two of these themes and look at them in a little bit more detail. Firstly, just looking at um, a fit for purpose approach to national health workforce planning. And I know that here in Ireland at the moment you're in the process of developing, I was going to say a new process. Processes in workforce planning are never new, but building on the lessons you've had from previous attempts and looking at a new way of doing it. The OECD did a, a very useful review of OECD countries' approaches to national health workforce planning, published a couple of years ago. They looked at 18 countries, 26 models, and I think there are some very salutary key messages came out of that work, which need to be on the front of any policymaker who, or politician even, who thinks that health workforce planning is going to be the answer on its own um, to deciding how many midwives you need in 10 years' time or obstetricians you want in 20 years' time. Um, planning is not an exact science. Anyone who pretends it is is, is misleading their clients. It's there to act as a decision support tool. It's there to enable policymakers and uh, politicians to frame and assess the likely implications of different choices around policies, but it's, it's not precise, it's not exact. Um, it can be used very effectively or it can uh, undermine in some cases what's going on. So that's message number one. Message number two, most planning models are utilization based. In other words, they, they look at the current types of service being delivered or where they're being delivered or what the population they're being delivered to looks like. 
and then projects that forward. Uh, very few get beyond that and begin looking at, well, what are the needs from the population? What does that mean in terms of skills and competencies? And what does that then mean in terms of workforce? Many are supply driven. Uh, so again, essentially they look at how many new fill the gap doctors, nurses, whatever, are going to have to come into the system next year or the year after. They don't take sufficient account of demand, the other side of the equation. And very few, surprisingly, are linked to funding. So the, the planning goes on in a bit of a vacuum, and then you walk to the, the Ministry of Finance, the Treasury, and say, look, this is how much money we need. Now, that, when, when is that ever going to work? That doesn't work. You need to be looking at costing your scenarios when you're planning um, and involving finance or treasury at an early stage so that they are alerted of some of the likely budgetary implications of what you're doing. And surprisingly also, many don't address current imbalances. So the planning assumption is that now is acceptable or okay. And what we want for the next 10 or 20 years is a replication of now in terms of numbers or mix. And that then means that whatever geographic imbalances you might have, um, professional imbalances, skill imbalances, the risk is you're going to replicate them rather than take planning as an opportunity not just to project forward now, but to think about alternative futures with different skill mixes or different allocations of workers in different places. So to distill it all down, OECD made a, a series of, I think, very helpful recommendations for any country that's thinking about national workforce planning. Take the long view, uh, look at supply side, but particularly in developed countries, there is a need to get much more accurate about likely retirement scenarios. Uh, on one hand, most high income countries are raising the retirement age, which might keep more people in work, but we're coming out of recession, and that means that people who delayed retirement probably will now think about retiring. So we've got to work out what that means in terms of you know, how many of the nurses who are in their 50s will be around in five years' time. Uh, assessing that will give you a better indication of how many more you need to be thinking about in terms of replacement. And much more emphasis on geographic distribution. Any country has uh, a mal-distributed or badly distributed health workforce when you match that against population need, population access. Um, Ireland is no different. It might be less pronounced here than in some countries, such as Australia, where the geographies are much larger. But there still is an issue of how do you get doctors to work outside urban areas? Um, how do you try and ensure that the referral patterns are dealt with effectively so not so many people have to come to hospitals. Those challenges are there in all high income countries. What do we mean by uh, integrated health workforce planning? The, the seminar that I was at yesterday, we looked at that issue in detail. I'm not going to go across it again in detail, but I think we need to ensure that in terms of integration, there are three dimensions of integration which connect into IPL. Firstly, Workforce planning, service planning, funding, all have to connect. If they don't connect, if one of those three is not part of the planning process, you're going to have to revisit, step back before you can move forward again. So thinking through service implications of workforce and education changes, uh, thinking through changes in funding and how that impacts on provision of IPL, for example. Uh, too often, Budgets for IPL will be the first that are raided when there is any kind of cost containment in a system. And um, that's not doing anyone a favor, but they are regarded quite often, I think, as a relatively easy touch by ministers or directors of finance. Integration of planning of different professions. If we're talking about IPL, uh, is part of uh, getting professions to work together more effectively. We also need to be looking at how well we can integrate the planning 
process so that we are uh, coming through with the right numbers of different types of health professional with the right basket and bundle of skills and competencies to meld together effectively as a team. Very few countries have got very far with integrating workforce planning across different professions. We still see in most countries uh, the medical workforce is planned here, the nursing workforce here, maybe allied health there, maybe pharmacist. There's no real attempt to think through the implications and knock-on effects of if we train 20% more doctors, that means we're going to need more or less of others. So if not integration, at least alignment is required across these different aspects of the overall planning process. And planning for an integrated team, predicating the whole assumption of planning on we are looking not to churn out numbers of doctors, numbers of nurses, numbers of AHPs. We're looking at teams that will work together effectively. And how can planning support that as the, the end objective? So, um, here's the quiz. Um, it doesn't really matter if you're paying attention or sleeping for the last 15 minutes because this is not related to anything I've said. Uh, it's a quote which really sets out the, the risks and dangers of over-specialization. And um, I'm willing to, to give a, a small gift to anyone who can guess the country and the approximate year. I'm beginning to, to get slightly risky when I do this because I've used this twice in public presentations and <laughs> you're never quite sure with the internet what, what might have gone somewhere. But anyway. Anyone guess the country? Yes. No. 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 Getting nearer. Uh, cold. Really cold. Warming up a bit. Uh, okay. Um, that, that was the easy part of the question, by the way. It's Egypt. So, it's a fairly straightforward quote and the response shows that you know it could come from a lot of countries um, any thoughts on roughly when this was published no 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 said before no 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 <laughs> so um, it's a cheap trick, really, but it's, it's to reinforce a point, which is um, a lot of the issues that we're talking about uh, really aren't that new. They've been around as long as um, there have been health professions. And uh, what we've got to work through is the implications of, of that and what we can do collectively to change the way people think if we are aiming more towards the professions coming together and the extent to which we need to challenge professions who want to become really, really specialised and whether that's a good thing for the population. So, um, you can go back to sleep now. Um, I, I, another couple of just graphics to, to make points which we need to bear in mind. The first thing is that countries are not the same when you look at the, the health workforce. This is just countries beginning with A, randomly selected almost. So, Ireland would look not dissimilar to Australia or Austria, which is at the right end there, you know, you've got roughly uh, three times as many nurses as doctors maybe in, in your system and you've got, you know, maybe 8, 10, 11, 12 percent nurses and maybe something around uh, three doctors per thousand population. But if you look elsewhere in the world, you'll find very different patterns and mixes and the big determinant, no surprise, is how much, money's, how much countries spend on health. The more they spend on health, the more they have a health workforce because health is labor intensive. So high income countries have got higher uh, levels of workforce. However, there are big cultural and regional differences. If you look at Argentina in the middle there, it has about three times as many doctors as it has nurses. And that's the common pattern in South America. Uh, parts of Southern Europe, Greece has got one doctor per nurse. Turkey has got less than one nurse per doctor. So 
we're not all in the same starting point when we talk about numbers or mix. And therefore, when we talk about what IPL might mean, um, it's going to have to look somewhat different in terms of how it's delivered, depending on the, the country we're in. Uh, a second point, and this is one specifically about Ireland. This is the, the new data which came out only about three weeks ago from OECD, an update on um, estimates of percentage of foreign nurses and doctors in different countries. Ireland, as I think it was 37% of its medical workforce, uh, is internationally trained. That's uh, well above the OECD average, and I think it's the fourth highest across the OECD. The issue here is, um, in terms of IPL, how do you maintain and deliver effective IPL to a workforce which was not pre-registered trained in your system, comes from a range of different systems with different cultures, uh, where in some countries nurses are very low status because they're women, and doctors are very high status because everything they do is right. Uh, into the system you've got, where, which is going to be more questioning, more collaborative. So there's, a, there's a, an issue there of bearing that in mind when you talk about the workforce, that it's uh, coming from many countries. Okay, um, moving on to the, the kind of policy issues. And I'm not going to read these through, but any health minister that I've ever had a conversation with about health workforce will be coming out with questions like this. They all want to know how to improve planning, how to keep more of their workforce, how to use the resources they have more effectively. And I was looking through that list and think, well, actually, IPL is a bit of an answer to any of those. But I bet if you talk to the health minister about IPL, you'd have to explain it to them. It won't be front and center on their agenda. And I think one of the issues is to ensure that we move it front and center and they get it, the policymakers, politicians get it immediately. We don't need to explain it. There is an evidence base, it's limited um, on I IPL. John talked about it more this morning. Again, I, I won't read this all through, but there's a limited evidence base out there that you can use, but it's not very big. And the conclusions are, as ever, when you get research at a right report, they say, we need more research. So you can't rely on the evidence base to make the case for you. You can use it, but it's not enough. And more broadly, the, health, the evidence base around health workforce is a bit rudimentary. It's improving quite rapidly, but there's virtually no high-level research on issues relating to scopes of practice, skill mix change, IPL, and how they then impact on population health or outcomes. So we're working with limited ammunition when it comes to persuasion. However, when you actually get involved with politicians and policymakers, you realize that even if you do have perfect evidence, there are a whole bunch of ways that they distort it or ignore it or turn it around to fit what they want to happen rather than what should happen. Uh, this is a... Um, um, drawn from a, a lovely book written a couple of years ago by the guy who's the science correspondent for the Times in, in the UK about the various types of abuse of, of scientific evidence um, from debate around climate to virtually everything else. And he's come up with this list of different types of um, evidence abuse. And you can read through them and you can immediately think of examples when that's happened in your own context or, or in your own country or your own political domain. So evidence is good, we need more of it, but even if we had perfect evidence, we need more than that to shift the agenda in IPL. Um, I used this quote yesterday. I live in Australia at the moment. This is um, something that the then Prime Minister was quoted at in a national newspaper, and um, he wasn't the Prime Minister very soon afterwards, so I don't know if the two facts were connected or not, but I was struck by how um, honest he, he was about his own situation, and, and perhaps a little naive also in terms of the, the final bit of the quote. But it does, again, just draw us up short and make us think and remind ourselves that 
It's also a, about politics. Any of these issues around health and different professions competing for training budgets um, and different parts of the service competing for budget. We need to be aware that this kind of discourse is going on in the background sometimes. So a couple of slides to finish. Um, enablers and constraints for IPL or, or IPE. Uh, I'm not going to go through these in detail, but they are enablers, possibly, or they are constraints, possibly, depending how they're configured. A uh, couple of examples, funding mechanisms uh, vary in different health systems. Depending how they're targeted, they can uh, persuade organizations to do different things or not. Uh, financial, non-financial incentives. A fee-for-service based system, when you try to uh, change skill mix, is going to stop you changing skill mix very effectively because if the doctor loses the task, the doctor loses the money. Um, if you have a salary system where the task shifts but the money doesn't, you're in a much easier place to try and get some skill mix change happening. Uh, legislation, regulation. You've done well in terms of introducing legislation to allow nurse prescribing to happen. Some countries don't have that. In fact, they've got a legislative system that clearly prevents anyone other than doctors ever prescribing. So it requires legislative change to, to oil, oil wheels. So the, those five dimensions need to be considered. Final slide. Uh, just three, these are kind of my... My message is thinking through um, IPL, coming at it from a bit of a quasi-outsider, being persuaded that it really is very important. But I think the three messages there are, are, are pretty straightforward. Firstly, make sure that when we're talking about it, it connects with planning, service delivery, funding. Secondly, engage with the community at large. And I, I love the, 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 the presentation before lunch. We need to be ensuring that the community, patients, the population, members of parliament, get it, understand it, are persuaded why it makes sense to have it. And yes, we've also got to improve the evidence base. But um, my sense there is that we can improve that incrementally and, and that will help. But much more of the emphasis has to be on the, the outward focus, funding it, sustaining it, and ensuring that really my final point that it's too important just to allow the educators to be driving it. They're good at it, but they need to be working with others, um, and I'm sure they'd want to do that. Thanks very much. Okay, um, thanks very much, James. That was a fantastic way to kick off the afternoon. So I'm happy to throw this open to the floor then. Uh, we have about 15 minutes for some questions or comments as well, any reflections that people have in relation to what James has, um, has set out to us and maybe what the implications are for us here. Okay, yeah, just in the middle of the room here. Thanks. Hello. Uh, hello, thanks, James. Thanks for your presentation. My question is in relation to the fundings you're talking about just now. Uh, in certain models, they're using the more like the lease based fundings. I suppose in the Australia, where you're from, is uh, ABA activity based funding. And in the UK, they use a lot of patient and patient follows their money. So I think two of them similar. The, the principle is, the, is needed the same. So, in what do you think about uh, in regards about these two funding models? Are they do you think they are the driving force for the IPL in these two countries? Thank you. Uh, I don't think they're the driving force um, in in either country. In fact, I don't think there is any country where the funding model itself drives an amount of, or a, a type of, or model of IPL. I think it's more likely that, as I said earlier, that um, issue number one is how much funding is available irrespective of model, and whether or not uh, any type of IPL, or in fact in service training of any sort beyond that, is going to be 
at risk if uh, there is budgetary constraint. And secondly, I think the issue then is setting that one to one side and looking at different models. That um, different models do lead to different behavior of individual practitioners, um, teams, systems, organizations. The, and the question for the country and the policymakers is not what funding model do we want, but what health system do we want and what are the health priorities? And then ensuring that the funding model that you have in place enables that to happen rather than cuts across it or, or prevents it happening. And I think one of the major challenges still in many countries which are talking about primary health care as the main delivery model, that when you look at the funding models in those countries, they're still predicated to channeling funding towards hospitals. And that's why most countries talk about primary health care as being the growth area, and in most countries it isn't the growth area, because the funding model is in place which is going to prevent that happening. So unless you look at changes in funding um, and link to that changes in system governance, you will continue to see that, that kind of secondary care model. When it comes to how individual health professionals or practitioners are remunerated, um, there, is, there is strong evidence that different models will lead to different behaviour from those individuals and behaviour that translates into how they prioritise, who they care, what they do when they're diagnosing, whether or not they um, prescribe more or less, whether they operate more or less. So I think we've, we've got to be fairly open and honest with ourselves and recognise that, again, that is going to be a factor which will lead to certain patterns of behaviour. And the issue, again, I think is, is your payment system, is your remuneration system fit for purpose? Is it going to lead to the behaviour that you want from your health professionals? And I think there's, there's one very interesting angle in here, which is more and more emphasis on multidisciplinary teams working together but very few examples of um, any attempt to reward and recognize teams. You'll still find usually that teams with different professionals in them come from different payment systems, different reward structures, perhaps even uh, different outlooks on what reward should look like. So, you know, that again is going to be a big challenge. There have been some uh, attempts at team-based rewards such as uh, shared governance, uh, sorry, um, gain sharing, which is in use in some hospitals in the States, but it's very at the margins of um, experience at the moment. I'm not sure if that's directly answered your question, but it's allowed me to talk for three minutes and seven seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, if there are any other questions, yes, in the middle of the room again. Uh, Cecily Roach. A uh, pharmacist. Uh, just a, qu a big picture question. Um, it's, we had silos up this morning. It seems to me that our departments are almost siloed from a policy level. So we have health, we have education, we have mm. just a social welfare. From a policy level point of view, what would you suggest would be the department that should lead on this? Health. Okay. Um. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of an, I'll answer more in detail and in, indirectly. Um, a few years ago, I helped facilitate um, what was called a policy dialogue uh, in a country that I won't name, but is um, in this region, but but a lot hotter. Um, and it was being run in the the language of the country, and it was a very important meeting because the country had brought in a range of um, bilateral and multilateral donors, including the EU. And the idea was to impress the donors with progress on workforce, health, workforce planning and policy in the country so that the donors would come in with a second tranche of funding. And it was going well and it was all being, uh, and being translated as we went. 
And about halfway through the day, um, the door burst open. I was cheering it. The door burst open. This guy came in, sat down, took a microphone, said something for a couple of minutes in quite a loud voice, and then left. Uh, and I looked around at the translator and asked her, you know, what was that all about? Uh, and she said, um, he's from the Ministry of Education. He was just telling everyone that you can't believe anything the Ministry of Health tells you. <laughs> um, and he then left again. So um, that's, that's a, an example of um, a lack of joined up government. I, th I think if, I'll slightly rephrase my, my one word answer. I think health is best place to lead because it is responsible usually uh, either directly or indirectly for service delivery. Um, it's usually responsible for employing most health workers or if not for some governance mechanism which is in place to try and ensure that there are sufficient health workers in, in different parts of the, the country. Um, and in a sense, it is the client of education. Um, so it should be in some sort of, I think, contractual relationship <clears throat> with education so that it has both the ability to provide signals on what competencies and skills are required, but also some ability to influence that. And um, I'd, I'd point to my own country of Scotland where for example, the workforce planning conducted nationally on how many nurses are we going to train. The planning is conducted on behalf of the chief nurse in the Ministry of Health, and she has the education budget. She then takes the numbers and contracts with education providers in terms of how many will be allocated to different providers in the country. Um, it brings education and health to the table and allows I think an appropriate discourse to happen about not just the how many question, but uh, what skills are we looking for? Um, do we need more or less of this in the future? And the driving force of having that contractual relationship allows this process to go on as a funding stream very closely allied with, with the planning function. Okay, that's great. Well, um, I'll wrap it up there. Uh, we're at 2.30 now. So uh, from 2.30 to 3.30, we will have the parallel workshop sessions. Uh, so there are four workshops, uh, one here in the main hall, one in the Chesterfield, one in Latouche, and one in the president room. Now, most people have probably pre-booked a session. So if you make your way directly there, for people who haven't pre-booked a session, uh, the Chesterfield uh, room session is full. Uh, but we uh, have some room here in the main hall uh, where there's a session going on or also some room um, in the Latouche or in the President's room. So if you make way directly to the parallel sessions, they're ongoing until uh, 3.30 when there's an opportunity for some refreshments and poster viewing. And then we'll see you back here again at a quarter to four. Thanks.